Attention all cheese lovers. Domino's new five cheese mac and cheese is penne pasta and a blend of cheese made with 100% real mozzarella, cheddar, American, Parmesan, Asiago, and Alfredo sauce oven baked to creamy, bubbly perfection. It's creamy, craveable, and customizable with delectable add-ons like bacon, jalapenos, or spicy buffalo sauce. Enjoy as a meal or as a side dish to share with friends. The new five cheese mac and cheese from Domino's. It's a whole new way to love cheese. Order online or on the Domino's app. This episode is brought to you by AARP. Ten years from today, Lisa Schneider will trade in her office job to become the leader of a pack of dogs. As the owner of her own dog rescue, that is. A second act made possible by the reskilling courses Lisa's taking now with AARP to help make sure her income lives as long as she does. And she can finally run with the big dogs and the small dogs who just think they're big dogs. That's why the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org skills. Welcome to the Media Roundtable Special Edition, where we dive into the secrets of the craft of perfecting your audio campaign to maximum effect. This show uh, is in service of the marketers who are responsible for the success of their audio program. We call them the Chief Audio Officer. I'm your host, Dan Granger, CEO and founder of Oxford Road. And we've got um, a really, uh, uh, it's a it's a kind of a big deal what we're doing today, not just because of who's uh, going to be at the media roundtable with me for this subject, but also what it is that we're launching. Um, we have been presenting and kind of dripping a lot of content um, over the last couple of months that came out of a, an event we did in July where we brought a huge uh, percentage of the audio marketplace together in one room for our chief audio officer summit. And one of the most meaningful outputs uh, that came from that summit was our forthcoming report called What Brands Want. And what we did was we surveyed everybody in the room in real time and asked them questions about um, not just uh, their campaigns or things that were specific to them, but what, what are they, what are, what's hard about the world of audio for brands and what do they wish was in place that would make it easier for them to be successful uh, utilizing the channel. And our hope was that by consolidating that feedback, kind of packaging it up and getting ready um, to share that with the world, that people on the supply side, whether you're a publisher uh, or an agency or a, or a tool provider, that you can take the, the direct feedback of that prime constituency of actual end users, the buyers, the chief audio officers, and organize your solutions accordingly. Because I think what happens a lot of times in this business, and it's probably not uncommon for media, is that publishers and platforms end up kind of setting all the rules and everybody else has to react to it on the buy side. And our thesis here is kind of say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe the purchasers should have a little bit more voice in where this thing goes and, and how they can use it. So um, to address this and to walk in excruciating detail with you through the results of that report, this report forthcoming for those of you that are uh, watching us on YouTube today, we have a crack team of all-star thinkers, thought leaders in this space. I'm going to start with on the Oxford Road side. Uh, reintroducing some people that uh, Media Roundtable listeners are very familiar with. We'll start with uh, Neil Lucy, EVP of Strategy and Product at Oxford Road. Welcome, Neil. Thank you for, for participating today. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be back. It's, it feels like it's been a while, actually. Although I guess I was on, was I on the podcast recently from the CAO Summit? Yeah, the I don't I think it only felt like a long time because my preamble is so long. <laughs> I, think, I think we just got to it like a normal introduction. <laughs> Might not feel so distant. We're glad you're with us, Neil. We also have Giles Martin uh, from uh, from across the pond uh, who's joining us today. Where it's it, it's it, I think he said it's 3.30 in the morning where he is. Giles, it's good to have you with us back good at the media roundtable. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for accepting the call. Uh, and then... Uh, we have, I would just say, the 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 CAO of CAOs uh, among us. We have one delegate from the tribe of the chief audio officers, 
uh, who has been sent forth to speak on behalf of the whole marketplace, billions of dollars being spent. We have the great Ryan Swartz back with us today. If you don't remember who Ryan is, uh, he's more than a seasoned CAO. You know, Ryan started on the agency side and like a gladiator, he just kind of purchased his freedom uh, and is now uh, sitting on top of, of Brand Mountain. He's worked for some um, some great companies where he's led marketing efforts across channels, but audio often being a key feature of that. I'll drop some names. Constant Contact, Shutterstock, LegalZoom, all great brands that have really been, I think, um, impactful uh, in audio. And so, Ryan, we're glad to have you with us today. It's, Thank you for joining. I'm happy us. to be here. I I like the description as a gladiator. I think it's uh, very suiting, and and I feel very comfortable speaking on the behalf of uh, advertisers around the world um, and and using my voice to put words into their mouth. Thank you for doing that. This is the greatest preface to a show I think we've ever had. <laughs> um, and uh, Ryan, Ryan's been a friend for a long time and um, always gives us great insights. Oh, and he's featured in, in this report. So if you're not listening, when you download it eventually, uh, you're going to be able to see his his uh, his, his smiling face uh, as he's quoted in the document. So uh, maybe we get to the point here. Um, so we did this. We, we, we basically we had this terrible system. Uh, at the event, we've got a room full of CAOs. You know, if, if you look at like the Magellan list, of, they, they put out the top 15 uh, brands in podcasting. People usually talk about podcasting as a short hand for audio. Um, and, and five of the top 15 were in the room. So, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, you could say that we had about a third of the market uh, participating and I don't think I, I look, I've been working in audio for over two decades. I've never seen um, a forum where so many brands that actually cared about this channel came together uh, with one voice to collaborate and to make that voice heard. And so so I think this is really a first of its kind report. I think that we're going to keep doing this. I think this is going to be an annual report. And I think, you know, kind of based on the merits of what's going to come out of this discussion, um, you know, we will evolve the shape of the report over the years. But I think this has meaning and is going to be very, very valuable uh, in the marketplace as we try to build a better ecosystem. Um, so I guess just kind of starting at the start, Neil, I'm going to put you in the hot seat you know, what do you hope, because you were super involved in bringing this all together, what what do you hope to see as a result of us bringing this information out? And then we'll get into some of the, the kind of brass tacks. What I would hope that comes out of this is at the end of the day, we're, we serve the marketer's needs, right? And it is important for us as agencies or agents of the marketers as well as our publisher partners, the people that, you know, the media owners to understand what their needs are, where, where we're falling short, uh, where there's additional work that needs to be done, particularly in audio. I mean, I think we think about audio and we think about the 20 or 25% of time spent, but the four and a half of four and a half percent of, of media dollars We'd like to see more of that investment coming into audio. And one of the ways to do that is to give marketers more confidence in the medium, be it podcast, streaming, radio, satellite, that it works, it can be measured, and that they're going to get a return when they invest in these channels. Well, and I think that's, I think we all share that. And, you know, I think the, the thesis under a lot of this, uh, I think, for the market is that we know that a lot there's a lot more time spent with audio as a channel than percentage of dollars that it represents. So it is an undervalued channel. I think that there's plenty of statistics that support that, you know, it's like less than 25 percent of the average value given the time that consumers spend with the channel. But there's so many points of friction there's so many unique nuanced things you have to do to kind of pull the the power out of the channel and 
you know, I think Ryan, you can speak to what audio can actually do for a brand. It may not be able to be your largest driver forever, but it for many brands, and I think you've been on the other side of this, it, it can be the first driver that becomes transformative and opens a company's eyes to what customer acquisition can look like at scale through a demand generation channel that then kind of propels that business to start taking larger risks. I can't tell you how many D 2 C companies we've worked with over the years that never did anything other than search and social. And then they do a successful pilot and audio, they grow that channel. And then now all of a sudden they have the confidence and the budget and the scale to start doing things like TV. Um, so, you know, as we think about the barriers, the biggest one that always comes up is measurement. And, um, and before we get into the stats that were revealed here, Ryan, um, I just want to help let you frame this for us a little bit. W why do you think measurement is so hard in this channel? And how big a barrier do you think that is in terms of audio getting the utilization that it should? I, I think it's a big barrier. And um, the, the difficulties with measurement just come from the nature of the channel. I will say, you know, compared to... 2011, 2012, back in those days when when podcasts were first starting, and and even you know the history of terrestrial radio, it's gotten much better. Thank goodness, uh, you you actually can do pixel tracking, and you you actually can get uh, impression reports and and things like that to to help you track back and and compare with site traffic, but. When you think about just what what brands on the client side are, are dealing with these days and the tough decisions that executives have to make in terms of you know real things that will affect their bottom line, they want data. That's yeah. that's the number one thing they want. And you know, we're at an age where we believe that you can trust the data for everything to back up and support all your decisions. So while audio and, and podcasts in particular are much better in providing that data and, and you can do some advanced modeling and, and pixel tracking and surveys and, and things like that, it's still not as reliable as click-based data or the data that you get from digital media that everyone wants to take a look at and, and have solid, you know, factual um, actions that took place that, that they can measure against, that they can forecast against and that they can project an expected outcome from. Totally uh, agree with that. If they don't know what to expect, um, then it, it becomes murky. And I think it goes to the bottom of the hard pile, right? And I, and I think that's where a lot of times audio lives. So, so uh, let's start talking stats. Let's talk about what, what, um, what you and your peers shared with us, Ryan. Um, Giles, you, you kind of led the discussion throughout the day about tools. And so, so let's talk about that. Can you share with us what the feedback was uh, and what stood out to you about the tools that are available to marketers in this channel? Uh, I presented a, a few slides about tools earlier in the day that covered um, not just measurement, but, you know, planning and, and strategy and measurement, you know, throughout the whole beginning soup to nuts uh, to through to the end of a campaign and there was dozens and dozens and dozens of logo on, logos on that slide and I think it speaks to the complexity of the audio space um, and I think that you know you can see that first of all in in the CAOs telling us that well only 30 percent or 31 percent of them said that they understood the tools for audio measurement very well so there's already um, a, a lack of familiarity, which I think puts people on the back foot in audio. Uh, and you know, to to the points we were just making is one of the reasons that the digital channels, uh, you know, tend to get favored more often with budget because the tools are more familiar and it feels like a, you know, um, a safer, more comfortable place. Um, I think beyond that. Um, you know, it was very interesting to see that 83% found the tools available in audio somewhat less or much less useful than the tools that they have available in other channels. And I'd like to invite Ryan's perspective on this because obviously he works in, you know, those other channels much more than I do and probably is more familiar with the tool, the tool sets. But, um, 
you know, I, you think about the the closed ecosystems that are out there, you know, Facebook and, and the Google ecosystem, um, particularly, it's very easy for, for uh, advertisers to set up campaigns to execute them and to get results back. Um, and obviously questions are being asked more and more about the integrity and reliability of those results in those closed ecosystems, but it's a plug and play soup to nuts type process again, where there is at least the perception that you're getting to Ryan's point, you know, data that you can use to drive the business forward. And, and, and to the extent that you can link them to clicks, you can link them to observable actions. I think people feel confident in those tools. They feel those tools are useful and that's what creates, you know, that gap with audio where there's less certainty and, and therefore those those tools are felt to be less useful. R Ryan, do you have any further comments on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, there, there's so many tools available, like you just mentioned, you know, the um, all the logos that you had on, on your slides that you presented, you know, a lot of them are for planning, are for media strategy, you know, things that will help you all as an agency, you know, really approach the marketplace and, and buy things mindfully and put plans to execution, you know, really well. But I think, I think what's lacking to me in terms of, of different tools, whether it's tracking, whether, whether it's modeling, attribution, measurement, and especially if they're kind of closed systems, like you mentioned, is it's really hard when you're grading each channel um, or each platform on a different scorecard than the rest of your channels. Uh, you know, I when I'm when I'm looking at you know media mix and and different spends across channels and and trying to track that back to how much traffic they're driving and how many trials they're driving and and subs. You know, oftentimes I'll see a lot of those metrics reported, but they're coming from different systems. And guess what? The sum of, of the different pieces are not going to add up to the same whole that your CFO or CEO is looking at um, in terms of, you know, what is the truth in, in terms of performance? I, 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 I want to stop you there for one second because you've got, there's gold here. Um, so, so we do hear this a lot. You talk to a CMO on behalf of a channel. You, you got a generalist marketer surrounded by a bunch of specialists all advocating for their channel, right? Yep. And you go, oh, well, you're all telling me that this was your performance, but it all adds up to, you know, 200% more sales than we achieved. So this yeah. is not possible, right? Yeah. When you're having those discussions as a marketer, how disproportionately um, affected do you think uh, audio is compared to the other channels? Do you feel like this? everybody has this issue? Um, I feel like audio has it for sure. Uh you know, the video channels, linear TV especially has it, but I also think, you know, your, your typical display, you know, retargeting and, and prospecting media has it as well. You know, I've, I've looked at a thousand MTA, you know, multi-touch attribution model readouts, and they say, wow, your, your display, your, your prospecting campaigns, you know, your digital banners are killing it. You know, it's, it's, they're, they're accounting for, X percent of, of attribution of, of all this traffic and all these conversions. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I, then why aren't we seeing it on the bottom line? Like I, that's, that's just not true. Um, but you know, it's the attributions model and, and the fact that a channel is showing up in a conversion path and, you know, you, you have to have percentages allocated just across channels. So, you know, I think, I think display, you know, channels like that get, you know, a lot of skepticism, um, you know, when it, when it comes to those results. Um, but, you know, at least there's clicks and, you know, sometimes view through impressions and things like that, that are attached to that. Sometimes with your audio programs and your linear TV, you don't even have that. So you're, you're using even different methods of matching back to when a spot aired on TV, when a spot aired, you know, on terrestrial radio, uh, when an ad was served in a podcast, and trying to map it back to any spikes in site traffic that were, you know, within a certain time window of that. So there, there's just a lot more variables at, at play and a lot more assumptions that you have to make. So um, I think the, the skepticism becomes even more as you, mer you know, move 
further from the bottom of the funnel to the top of the funnel. It's interesting because, I mean, these stats are pretty damning. I mean, Giles said it, but just to kind of restate the punchline here, 14% like the audio measurement tools better than other channels and 83% like them less and somewhere between somewhat and much less. So that's not good. And even though everybody's always kind of pulling at the pant leg of the, the, the marketer going, give me more credit, give me more credit. Like, yeah, I know that, you know, maybe audio is toward the front of the line on that, but why are the tools so shitty? Why, what, what, why is, why is this more problematic than what you will log into, uh, during, uh, you know, uh, the morning that you're trying to look at performance? I, I mean, I, I think it's just availability and, you know, timeliness of, of data. Honestly, it's, you know, if that I'm looking, delay that lag. Yeah. And the fact that you have to project on that and you don't always get to tag them with a pixel. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Marketers, marketers, you know, CEOs, CFOs love search. They love SEM. Yeah. Why? Because you see this, this customer, they entered this query, they clicked on this ad and they converted, you know, like it, it, you can't argue with it. You know, it's, yeah. it's the easiest path to follow, but you know, like I said, the, you know, that's at the bottom of the funnel, the, the further up you go, the, the mercury, murkier it gets and the more channels, you know, that contributed to that ultimate conversion. And, and by the way, driving that query on search, um, you know, there's just so many more touch points in between that. So, um, you know, I, I will say in my mind, you know, a media mix model MMM is, is probably the best read you're going to get on holistic channel performance, you know, where it, it judges all your channels on the same playing field at least, but it's a very data intense and, and work hour intense process. You're often not refreshing except on a, on a quarterly basis. So it's not capturing any, you know, pivots you make in, in strategy in the meantime, and it's backward looking. So, you know, you, you're, you're making decisions based on, you know, what happened six months ago, but, you know, it is the best in terms of, you can measure a cost per session or a cost per conversion, um, you know, and have that same metric to compare across each channel. I, I've always, I want, I want the other guys to chime in here, but I've always had a hard time. I mean, I remember working with, with you or, or one of the brands that you represented in the past and, and trying to feed in post log data uh, to figure out the MMM model and to, to feed the MMM. And, and it's like, well, but you've got this crazy lag because somebody that's sitting on a couch with a device in hand is uniquely better positioned to respond in in a in that window relative to when ad was served than somebody driving down the street uh, who doesn't have autopilot and actually may need to remember something and do it later, right? Like it, it's very hard to make that apples to apples. Um, I do think it's interesting that you flag it though, you know, when we so so just to give a little more context on the audience responses. So in the room of respondents, what you have to remember is that we didn't just have a big chunk of audio advertisers. The chunk that we had, I think, probably over-indexed on their engagement with the channel. Not everybody cares, right? Some people care, and that's why I think they're more engaged on getting to better tools and better systems. We asked them, what is their primary KPI as marketers? I would say approximately a third of them were top or mid-funnel. Two thirds of the people in the room were lower funnel as their primary KPI. And then we also asked them, "What uh, what tools are you using?" And it was interesting. It's it, it's okay that it doesn't add up to a hundred, but you had fifty seven percent saying MMM, you had forty three percent saying survey based, and forty three percent saying pixel based. So those two are actually tied. Now, Ryan, you have done survey based. And you have done Pixel and you have done MMM I and mean, you've done all three at most brands, I suspect. How often does the survey, how'd you hear about us data match the MMM data that you see? It's, I, I mean, they're, they're pretty different 
ways of, of measuring. So I, I would say not at all, um, other than just directionally, perhaps, you know, you're with the survey data, you know, you're usually, you know, at the mercy, first of all, of, of survey biases. So, you know, you're, you're having to rely on, hey, are people actually remembering correctly? You know, where they heard the ad, what program it was, what platform it was, are they, you know, just selecting the top answer of the survey, no matter what it is. So, you know, all of those things come into play. And then you also have to do some type of gross up factor usually. So you're comparing the amount of, of orders that people say came from a certain program or podcast, and you're comparing that to your total, you know, orders received within a certain time and, and trying to, you know, give it value and, and apply a gross up factor. Again, there's just, there's more variables at play. So the likelihood of it representing the truth is, is less. Um, you know, media mix models, you know, like I said, I, I think, I think they at least take the time and, and try to grade everything on, on the same scorecard and, and on the same playing field. But, you know, you mentioned the problem with, with audio and, and terrestrial radio in particular, you know, where people are in their car oftentimes. So how does the model know that they reacted, you know, five days later from when they heard the, the ad in their car? But, um, you know, I think in those cases, it's like a, hey, they have better data for all other channels and, and what might be left, maybe we'll assign that to audio and, and radio. So that's kind of the case. And Honestly, I've seen that actually work in, in audio's favor a little bit. And, you know, I've, if anything, I've questioned like, wow, is performance really that good? It's a good question to ask. Yeah, I was going to add on the MMM side of things. I think the ideal for me is there's, is having two MMMs in place. So one is a sales model and one is an awareness model. And the awareness model so the sales model is just giving credit to like to the media channels based on sales the awareness model will take into consideration those channels that are driving awareness which some of the channels show up better in the awareness model than they do necessarily in the sales model so you know and i think you know television in that instance so like search can get a lot of credit, but uh, but I think we all know that search, a lot of search is driven by other media activities. You take away those media activities, then your search isn't going to be as effective. So that's, it is trying to give proper credit to the channels, uh, which I think is important. If, if you're doing MMMs, ideally you have both, if you can afford it, you have both the sales and awareness model in place. Yeah, I think that that's um, a really interesting point. You know, I think back to what you quoted us, Dan, a third of the audience said they were measuring middle or upper funnel and two thirds are measuring lower funnel. Um, and maybe one of the reasons that, that people feel the tools are less useful or they feel a bit frustrated is because they know that these audio channels, particularly radio, and also, I would say podcasts, which we always see score very, very well on pretty much any brand survey metrics that are put against it. We know that these channels are doing a lot of work beyond just the work that they do at the bottom of the funnel, but it's typically not really considered at all. And, um, you know, I think back to this, you know, stat that I often quote and I try to get people to, to pay attention to and get interested about, which is that through all the work that's been done over the past 30 years in MMMs and in single source survey research, what the general findings have been and what's always been a rule of thumb in the industry, I think, is that the long term effects of advertising are as big again as the effects that marketers typically can measure using any techniques that they have. So whatever you think your CPA is, actually, it may be twice as good as that in reality, when you actually consider the longer term impacts. And so I think our channels do a lot of work in this middle and upper funnel of these, in these areas. And, um, you know, the tools aren't great to, to measure them, you know, and as Neil said, like that awareness model is, 
is a, a really interesting thing to practice and to test and to try and connect those dots, particularly then ultimately between awareness and sales. But it's still you know, an uncommon practice. And so partly the responsibility is on, on the marketers, if they have the resources, of course, to, to you know, do some of that, that hard work themselves. It's not just about the tools. Okay, pop quiz. Have you ever heard of these companies? Shopify, Bayer, Oracle, Indeed, Masterclass, Babbel, Tommy John. We could go on. You know, I don't just host the Media Roundtable podcast, but I have the good fortune of being the CEO of a company called Oxford Road, where we are the world's leading independently owned and operated agency specializing in audio. Think podcasts, radio, and streaming. And what that means is that we get to help great companies, companies worth fighting for, grow with audio advertising, whether it's podcasts, radio, or streaming, and all its various tentacles. This includes media planning and buying. We do analytics, attribution, and insights. We also have a special way that we deal with creative and copy generation. It's our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. Bottom line is we don't just work here. Audio is our passion, and we want to lead this industry to new heights uh, beyond what we've ever seen so far. That's why we've been leading the industry in brand safety and suitability and actually bringing you solutions to market so that you can evaluate the way uh, that you get placed in a show so that it matches up with your values in addition to avoiding the things that you know might be prob problematic for your brand. If you're a chief audio officer and you're looking to get best in market performance at maximum viable scale, do get in touch with us at OxfordRoad.com. Or if you love audio and are strategic, relentless, and looking for a career change, consider joining our mission as a fellow agent of influence. Just flip us your resume through OxfordRoad.com. And if you're working anywhere in the audio industry and you're serious about this business, make sure you go to OxfordRoad.com, easy to spell. Sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer, at OxfordRoad.com. And make sure you mention that you heard about us on the Media Roundtable podcast. So I, I'm going to... Uh do a quick round robin with you guys before we move on to the uh, other results we got in the report and just say, okay, so clearly we have a consensus that this is a hard channel to measure. One piece of advice you have for CAOs that are, uh, that are grappling with it today. Ryan, you want to start? Sure. I'll, I'll lead us off. You know, I, I think the, the pixel tracking is, is probably the best you're going to get to, you know, the truth um, and, and something that you can point out to your CMO, your CEO, your CFO as data that they can latch onto and actually agree with and, and not question or poke too many holes in. The, uh, the, the problem with that, I would say, is it, it requires a lot of diligence. Uh, and, and most companies that I've worked for, that I've worked with, you know, nobody has their data warehouse in order and nobody has hmm. you know, loads of time from their analysts to dedicate to you know, agencies and, and doing data validation and pass through and, and the setup. You know, it's, it's always a super constrained resource and to do it properly, you need to have the data feeding back and forth. You need to have it validated and you need to be doing matchbacks to trials and, and orders and, and feeding that back to the agency as well and having like this really good uh, closed loop system. But it takes a lot of time and, you know, people lose patience and diligence and, and they just want to get things up and running quick. So it, it becomes an afterthought. So that, that probably is your best chance for success but it, it takes a lot of diligence to get it set up properly. Okay, so Ryan, we started this conversation talking about the tools and people's frustration with the tools, but what you're talking about sounds like it's a lot, about, a lot more than the tools themselves. How much of it is about having somebody that has the resources and the expertise, basically the capabilities of executing versus the... the it, does it really even matter which tools you're using if you know what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, it, I'd say it's like 
75, 80% having the people that know what they're doing have access to, to data and actually can connect the pipes and operationalize it. You know, the, the tools are great, but it's, you know, it, everyone's heard garbage in, garbage out. Like if you don't set it up properly, stay on top of it and, and have people questioning and asking the right questions, it's, they're not going to tell you anything. So it sounds like maybe these 83% of people that are unhappy with the tools, maybe we're deflecting a little bit and really we need expertise and uh, execution uh, focus. Uh, that's an interesting uh, turn of events. <laughs> uh, I'm going to second Ryan's suggestion that having pixel measurement, I was surprised to be honest. You were. That, in that room, I think you said 43% yeah. of marketers. Uh, are by the way, exact same as survey, 43 and 43. I, I, I would have guessed 80 to 90% because mm -hmm. I know that in, in that room, there were a lot of performance marketers. Um, I, know, I know of one brand marketer in particular, like I don't, I can't really tick off other brand marketers off the top of my head. I know another marketer in that room that doesn't put pick doesn't use pixels. So okay, they're they're out of the equation. But I just would have expected 80 to 90 percent. So if if you can take advantage of pixel measurement, um please do so. And then the second thing, um, and and it's always really trying to understand, you know, what is what is it really adding is to have pixel based measurement with incrementality so we're doing that um with some of our clients i know one client in particular gets a lot of value out, out of having incrementality as a part of their pixel measurement it has uh made them help them make smarter decisions in terms of where they're placing their media dollars be it in streaming or in podcasts uh Pod, a, a podcast in particular that is very premium priced that probably wouldn't be on the plan um, if the incrementality wasn't in place because it, it shows how much incremental value that podcast is bringing to the business. Um, so I, I would just add uh, pixel-based measurement. Um, if you can have a pixel on your website, if you can do it, go for it, you should. And then try to include an incrementality measure with that. Um, I'll give a plug to Claritas. They're expensive, but they have a they have a pretty good solution for incrementality. And I'll give Giles a final world because word because <laughs> he's the be all and end all here. <laughs> I, I I don't know if I have that much to add actually. I mean Ryan's perspective is really interesting because he's talking from the realities of inside the client organization and all of those challenges. And it's hard to counsel a CAO in terms of all of that really, really important stuff because we don't, you know, we don't touch that side of your your world really, but we can talk about the tools that that you can use and, and some of the things that we've seen other CAOs and other brands struggle with. Absolutely, we advocate pixel measurement as the first, um, as the first approach, but we also recommend triangulation. And, um, and with pixels, as Neil said, I always advocate for, for lift um, studies. Getting a good control group is important, but if you're not if you're not using a control group, even if it's somewhat limited, you're definitely going to be over evaluating. Um, and so that's a really, really important piece. Um, and other than that, I think perhaps I would say, you know, it's in a way, this is an impossible problem. And I've seen, I think more and more, you know, marketers and teams constantly refining their approach, constantly changing, constantly trying to find a sort of a perfect solution. And, and there is no perfect solution. And we can all be guilty as marketers of overthinking these things. And I think you've got to find a system that's good enough and 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 settle with it. And Sometimes the best way to evaluate your, you know, what you believe to be true is to take some biggish swings in market. Um, and we've even said this to clients, even about our own channels. Like if you think that podcast is really working for you, then turn it way up or turn it way down or turn it off. We've even said that to clients because that can 
be a way to help clarify the signals that are coming into the business. Um, and yeah, those can be big decisions and sometimes take a lot of courage, but they, they ultimately, I think, can help provide a little bit of, of solidity and guidance through what's often a very um, murky and challenging maze at times. It's uh, I'm going to go back to the phrase um, that they used to throw around uh, at ZipRecruiter, which was, um, you know, attribution is like religion. Uh, at some point, yeah. you, you just got to pick something and decide that that's what you're going <laughs> to accept. That's what right? you're going with. And put yeah. your faith in it. Right. Um, but, you know, I think to your point, this is a forever journey and you never really arrive and um, you know, the, the journey is the destination to some extent, because you're never going to nail it. And it, it was interesting. I had a call this week, uh, with somebody that's been an institution in this channel for, uh, more than a decade, maybe, maybe two or more. And, um, they were saying how, you know, when we started, we never thought about branding. We never thought about awareness. This was an ROI channel for us always has been. And then something happened over the years where we found that we had built a brand on these channels inadvertently. And now we don't know, you know, our, now our measurement practices are all screwed up because there's a lot of people that became aware of us through these audio channels and never went through the mechanisms we were using to track them. And so having to account for that it, it is a real challenge. Um, but I, I, I guess to, to summarize, yeah, we're, um, we have to stay in this fight and accept that at some point you're only going to get so good at it. Um, and it's a moving target. Okay. Uh, let's jump to the brand safety piece really quick. Um, there's really one hero stat that came from our, our audience that I think is valuable here. Um, and Neil, I'm going to ask you to react to it first, uh, which is, you know, we, we asked people how comfortable they are, um, we asked them about like what their primary safety concerns between, um, a number of different choices, but two of the leading choices were political extremism and political lean. And I just want to explain what the difference is there. So political lean means you, we asked marketers, are you primarily concerned on what side of the aisle they're on? Uh, because look, at the end of the day, I think we all know brands need to have standards. They want to be thoughtful about, you know, um, explicit language, sexuality, violence, these things do matter. But really the reason that we talk about brand safety all the time is because we live in this terribly polarized age and everything's a food fight, right? We've got culture wars raging all the time, which is a big business. And it, and a lot of that business is a media business and that's how mu a lot of money it is made by dividing people and making them upset. And so you have brands trying to figure out how to react to this and you've had it for a long time. We just had a massive change in the brand safety universe where the World Federation of Advertisers basically um, had Elon Musk and X declare war on them through the global advertisers for responsible media that had created the standards that we were all trying to work with to figure out how to even evaluate brand safety. And they shut that down the day after uh, they were sued by, by formerly Twitter X and people are going, well, what do we do now? And a lot of the things that people have always done and have done increasingly since the world's been more polarized, really in the age of Trump, you've had people start to do a shorthand and just say, well, no, no conservative. And if we stay off of conservative content, everything's going to be okay. And a lot of times that's actually true. But what this group said to us is that only 23% listed what side of the aisle you're on as a primary concern. They actually didn't think that it's about making sure that you sponsor what's on the left and not what's on the right, even though, I think we know from those of us that traffic in this stuff that you will de-risk your likelihood of blowback if you stay on the left. That's not what people were concerned about. What they said they were more concerned about, 62% of respondents said political extremism was their primary brand safety concern. So what that means to me is that 
it's less about where you fall. It's more about how close to the fringes you are. There's a lot more we can say about that. But Neil, I want to give you the first word um, on this. Were you surprised by the data? What what conclusions did you draw from this? Um, I I don't think I was surprised by the data that much. Um, what I think I draw from this is there's there's not a lot of media these days that doesn't lean one way or the other, you know, in in somebody's eyes, right? So I may see see something as completely middle of, of the road, but somebody else will say, oh, you know, that's a right leaning uh, publication or uh, or that's a left leaning uh, kind of perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important at, on the political lean perspective that there is less concern about that in order to reach your total marketplace, especially in news and pol political environment, you really have to find places that are on both sides of the equation. And I think it's important for all of us, um, whatever side of the alley you are, to kind of dabble in the other side because you'll get a different perspective and may actually change your perspective. So I, I think that uh, supporting those like responsible voices that are on either side of the aisle, I think is acceptable and should be encouraged because I think it's important. I think it's important to, to see things from multiple perspectives because it, it may change people's opinions. Um, I I agree that on the political extremism, um, you know, that that totally makes sense that you would want to steer clear of that. Um, I think be it be it be it far right, far, far right, or far, far left, um, or not reliable in terms of what's being talked about, those are things to be considerate of. I think the only other thing that you know we we face in podcasting in particular is it is a discussion based medium it's an opt in medium so those people that are listening have chosen those those podcasts they're comfortable with the with the content that's being talked about on those podcasts so i think that that's something to take into consideration as well um but we do want to we do want to support those that are responsible and how they're uh, presenting information and talking about information. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that, that happens here is uh, you think, well, if I want to support uh, the Ben Shapiro show, cause I think I'll get a lot of leads from that. You go, yeah, but I can't because every, everybody hates him. Uh, you know, most of the country is not a, not a believer in, in him and his politics and his approach. Uh, but you realize the people that don't like him generally are not going to spend an hour every day listening to him. So they're not really going to know. And the same thing on the left, if it's Pod Save America or Rachel Maddow, whatever you want, you're not going to have a problem in those audiences. The reason we have problems is because there is an economy around stirring up dissension. And so you actually get people who are paid to monitor and create attacks where they're taking whatever is said and trying to um, exploit that. And a lot of times there's a financial shakedown uh, kind of going on behind the scenes. So it's hard to know what's legitimate. Um, I, I thought one thing, and Giles, I want to ask you to react to this. Um, you know, what I, what I liked about this response was that, you know, my hope for like the future in more of a, uh, just a con from a, a bit of a concerned citizen standpoint is I think there is a problem when extremists have the loudest voice and the most market share or share of mind. I think that's what causes the most issues. And and what we've seen over the years, especially working with Ad Fontes Media, because they get three people to basically agree. So if you don't trust the machines, fine. You got somebody right, left and center that are all kind of putting their hand on the Ouija board and deciding what where these things should land so when you look at the media bias chart which is looking at political bias on the x-axis and reliability on the y-axis you get to see some common patterns that people have agreed on from both sides which is very fascinating and what you see is the further you are 
in your positions, the more extreme you are, the lower your reliability is likely to be when they actually go and try to do some amount of fact checking. The problem with fact checking, everybody wants to fight misinformation. Misinformation is not easily fought and you're never going to get a standard that media buyers are going to accept as authoritative for knowing what's truth and what's not truth because both sides are arguing about truth. So there's no common denominator. But if you accept ad fontes media, as I think we do, then you see that if you can, if you can find one of three things, you actually find out all three. Where there is extremism, there is misinformation. Where there is extremism, there is personal attack. So if you can measure extreme positions or how extreme positions are, or if you can measure personal attack, you also get clarity on misinformation without ever having to get anybody to agree on what that is. So what I like about this is that, okay, well, with our civility score that we've been working with Seeker on, that measures personal attack. If I avoid personal attack, I'll probably avoid extremism and misinformation. If I use Ad Fontes, it tells me extremism, or Seeker also has some capabilities to show you how, where you are on the aisle, uh, you'll avoid misinformation and personal attack as well that way. So there's ways to triangulate in brand safety that can be very, very helpful. Um, Giles, any uh, any reaction uh, from you on, on this data? Um... No, I just think the point about um, misinformation is a is a really good one and a really tricky one. Tricky one these days, you know. In the, in the old days of two or three broadcast channels, information was presented and it was just accepted as what was happening in the world. Um, and as you said, Dan, you know, people don't necessarily agree on what misinformation is these days. But I think if you look at the Ad Fontes chart and those organizations that tend to be in the middle at the top, organizations like Reuters or the BBC or the Associated Press. I mean, I think, you know, we have to believe that the quality or trustworthiness of that type of information, you know, is good. And I think you're absolutely right that there are correlations that go, you know, down and to the sides from there and that we can use those correlations to um, identify media that may present more risk in terms of misinformation or in terms of likelihood to be, uh, you know, uh, attacking or um, yeah, attacking of other 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 people and other other views. Um, thank you for that, and Ryan. I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm going to set you up by um, uh, calling out Brittany Clevenger, uh, who's alongside you in this report, uh, giving commentary on this topic. Um, Brittany is a better help. Better help is the top spending advertiser in podcasting. And I don't, I don't know, possibly all of audio. I'm not sure, but significant. And what Brittany says is, uh, we need the human touch. Um, she also says, uh, use the tools, but don't only use the tools, which I thought was awesome. Uh, she's pushing for the human in the loop in this process. Um, your response. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. Um, I think brand safety is is huge. You know, you you can't you can't ignore it um, if if you want to have success and and if you want to operate in the audio podcast space successfully. You know, I think Dan, to your point, you know, if you are in extreme programming or or even just slightly leaning programming where people are really expressing opinions and containing the content to only those opinions, you are going to hear from the other side one way or another. And if it's not the other side, it's the factions representing other sides that are trying to stir up dissent. So it, it makes it really hard for where you have to be. Um, in, in terms of AI, I agree. You know, the I've, I've worked firsthand with the Seeker Civility Score. I think it's great. Um, it's it's a great step in, in the right direction. You can at least, you know, look at a list of, of programs and, and trust the civility score that you're going to be in a, in a pretty safe environment. You can, you can choose where you accept risk or what your risk level is. Um, but I would say even if, if programs, you know, have a slightly lower civility score or, you know, they get dinged for something, it's it's worth actually digging in and 
listening to, you know, the, the commentary around why they got that score or what it was, because, you know, oftentimes people like to just, you know, or, or you get backlash, um, programs get backlash for certain things. And, and then all of a sudden people are jumping on board and outrage and they don't even know what was said or it was taken out of context. So I think it's really important to actually ground yourself in what the situation was um, so that you can know whether or not it's it's something you should be, you should have an extreme reaction to or, or pull back on. Um, so it's it's that combination of, you know, relying on tools, AI, uh, scoring and, and things like that, which are a great starting point, but you do have to provide that human filter as well. Well, and, and on that topic of AI, uh, this is our kind of final point from the report that we're going to bring up today. And I'm just going to ask you guys for one, one note on it. Um, and uh, it, we talked about AI and audio ads and how comfortable the question was on a scale of zero to five, how comfortable are you with AI generated host reads or cloned voices for personal endorsements? This was our question. Um, and there's a lot to be discussed about AI. We could do an old, uh, we can do a whole series on this. Um, but in this particular case, you know, we're concerned about the commercial aspects and we're concerned about credibility, right? So this is something we're watching very, very closely. Um, Giles, can you um, uh, kind of drum roll, present the punchline on this in your point of view? Well, we asked uh, the CAOs how comfortable they are with AI generated host reads. So AI, um, I was going to say masquerading as hosts. I think that that's really the key point, uh, which I get to in a second. But 80% um, of our audience had a comfort level of zero to two on this particular topic. People are not comfortable with the notion of AI generated host reads. And I think, you know, coming back to that word masquerading, the key part here is is in the the transparency and, and how it's handled and how it's presented. So you could have a show that like Arnold's Pump Club that is entirely AI based Whoa. and you know what you're dealing with. And so if you're going to engage in a show like that, then the lane lines are clear, right? But I think what we're getting at here is where those lines get blurred and you think that you're dealing with a real person who's really endorsing your product to their listeners, but actually, no, somebody is, uh, yeah, yeah, they are. Um, somebody is, um, you know, not really, it's not a real person who's actually endorsing the product. So I think probably what this stat is getting at is much like our earlier point about tools, not being only about the tools, but perhaps being about some other issues too. So I think this is also getting at just the general level of discomfort that people still have with AI because it's still new. We're still learning about it. We're still trying to figure out where the lane lines are, where the boundaries are, and we're not 100% sure what to do with it yet. So, you know, and you've made this point a number of times, Dan, very well. You know, the industry in many aspects is in a race to automate as much as possible um, and and benefit from the efficiencies of, of automation and AI as much as possible. And there's a lot of benefits to be had from that, but there's also risks. And we mustn't lose sight of what made the industry particularly so valuable to marketers in the first place, which was that authenticity and that personal connection and that authentic endorsement. Um, so yes, let's keep proceeding with AI and um, automation, but we certainly need to be very careful. And we've always advocated that this is just, I think, a validation of the, the position that you've taken, if I may say so. Thank you, Giles. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's important. Uh, Neil, uh, what say you here? Oh, what I say is uh, where we are today, um, this is still early days of AI. Um, so let's let's this may be the least of mind. our problems, huh? <laughs> yeah. So it's still very early days. It's new to everybody. I think the reaction I, and rightly so is going to be, yeah, I'm not interested in that for host red ads. I want the authenticity of host red ads. That may change. 
as people become more comfortable with AI, as it becomes more adopted, and as if if people are saying, if people realize, well, it's the host has endorsed, you know, is genuine, and they've just used an AI AI voice in the future, not today, to read that ad, that may become acceptable. Um, and then I think there are instances where it could be desirable. I mean, I, I, uh, I listen to Jack FM in LA, right? So it's a robo DJ. It's been a robo DJ for about 20 time. years. <laughs> I think it's at least 20 years now that they've had a robo DJ. If I'm running on that station, I would love to have the voice of Jack read my ad. <laughs> That's right. I think it would be the best ad. Because it's sure. the it's the most familiar voice on that station. So there's going to be exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan. So my my take, if you're investing in endorsement podcasts, radio host read ads, you're investing in authenticity and trust. And if there's anything that's compromising that, it's not worth it. You know that that's why you're making that investment is to borrow on the cred the credibility. You know, use that person's trust to reach their audience and and you know make the the positive brand association. So, at this point, you know, I I would back away from anything that jeopardizes that authenticity and, and trust. You know, just just like Neil and, and Giles said, um, you know, technology is getting better. Uh, there may be points where you can't tell a difference and, and you're not jeopardizing that. But, you know, the early iterations of, of AI that, that I've heard, you know, I, I like to provide feedback and, and have the ability to ask for edits or ask for changes in inflection and, and tone and, and, and things like that. And, and that's not what AI is very good at yet. You know, if you can solve for those things and you know, they can make it seamless and, and you're not losing that credibility or authenticity in the future, then I may be open for it. But um, for now, I think it goes against the reasons why you invest in endorsement in the first place. Yeah. And I think I, I agree with everything you guys have said. I mean, Neil, to your point about Jack FM, like that might be different because Jack, we don't know Jack's last name, right? <laughs> it's not a that's not somebody that you expect is giving you their own personal uh, point of view on the world, right? So in that type of situation, or like we've talked about AI translations to uh, foreign languages, or so they don't have to record 60 different calls to action as they localize things. You know, these are things where I think an audience is going to not feel betrayed, but hopefully there's some disclosure where I've been heartened in this is i think it started very fearful uh a year or two ago when this started becoming real and thought okay they're gonna really exploit and trash uh the credibility of the channel but i'm seeing so much movement now with people coming out and trying to push standards for disclosures that i think we're gonna be okay um what i i agree with what was said earlier i think trust is the new oil and um, robots and machines are going to do a lot more for us than they ever have before. So if you really want to have something that's unique, it's probably good that people know you and, and uh, that you have credibility. Uh, and, and that's what that's that's what this whole thing runs on. Uh, so the only thing I would advise everybody is don't be the one brand or the one uh, broker or the one publisher or the one creator who gets called out because you had AI do something that it turns out people didn't know it was AI doing and they felt betrayed by that. It's, it's somebody will be made an example of here. I'm sure of it. Even though I think generally we'll be okay, somebody's going to be the the uh, the one that gets, uh, uh, that becomes the use case and you don't want that to be you. So um proceed with caution with that guys we've gone long here uh but three very good topics i'm proud of this uh this what brands want report and i'm grateful uh because all, all of you uh had a hand not just in the discussion today but um in producing this thing and i and i really think it's going to make for a better ecosystem the more we can get the buying community and the selling community collaborating talking to each other about their needs 
and their desires. I, I think this is a very healthy process we're a part of. So thank you uh, for being a part of it. Thank you, Ryan, for representing all CAOs everywhere. That's $36 billion of annual media spend that you've been the ambassador for today. We thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I didn't let anyone down. And the Oxford Road Whiz Kids, Neil and Giles. Guys, thanks for making the trip. Uh, always, uh, always good to have you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining the Media Roundtable. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use your influence for good as members of the marketing community. We can advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify. If you're a marketer, and you want to align your brand values with extraordinary business outcomes, you should talk to our agency, Oxford Road. Go to OxfordRoad.com. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer is what we call it. It's free. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have feedback. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, and we want to be champions here. So email us, info at MediaRoundTable.com. Tell us where we can do better. Check out Ad Infinitum. That's our monthly creative podcast hosted by the great Stu Redwine. One thing I'm going to tell you about Stu Redwine is that we need to pray for Stu today. He's jumping off of a building as we speak. He's going to Universal City and he is repelling off of the Universal Hilton for the Union Rescue Mission on behalf of Oxford Road uh, in LA. He is doing that for charity and it sounds fine. And when you look at the building, you're like, oh, I could see that. But when you look at the pictures looking down from that building, this is the scariest thing I could ever imagine doing. So uh, listen to his podcast. He's an adventurer and a risk taker for good causes. Uh, thank you to our guests, Ryan, Giles, Neil. Also special thanks to Haley, Bianca, Kyle, Ezra, Mary Jane, Everett, Neil, the team at Sharp Pen Media and the team at Podcast One. As always, guys, influence responsibly. Attention all cheese lovers, Domino's new five cheese mac and cheese is penne pasta and a blend of cheese made with 100% real mozzarella, cheddar, American, Parmesan, Asiago, and Alfredo sauce oven baked to creamy, bubbly perfection. It's creamy, craveable, and customizable with delectable add-ons like bacon, jalapenos, or spicy buffalo sauce. Enjoy as a meal or as a side dish to share with friends. The new five cheese mac and cheese from Domino's. It's a whole new way to love cheese. Order online or on the Domino's app. This episode is brought to you by AARP. Ten years from today, Lisa Schneider will trade in her office job to become the leader of a pack of dogs. As the owner of her own dog rescue, that is. A second act made possible by the reskilling courses Lisa's taking now with AARP to help make sure her income lives as long as she does. And she can finally run with the big dogs and the small dogs who just think they're big dogs. That's why the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org skills.